I'm about to introduce a gentleman to you that is my pastor. And the last time he was here, he criticized my singing. <laughs> and so I took like $100 worth of singing lessons. And at the end of those lessons, the teacher gave me my money back. <laughs> I guess that means that I'm not ever destined to really be a singer other than I hum occasionally. So maybe that doesn't bother everybody. Uh, my wife and I decided probably three, well, even longer than that, a month or two ago, that we were going to relocate our church home. And uh, it wasn't very difficult to find a place where we really felt welcome, and we had an extra bump there also because our grandchildren live in Bull Verde and go to Dick's church. And so it was a special opportunity to find someone who could uh, blister your whiskers off preaching on Sunday morning, if you have whiskers, no offense ladies, and uh, then in addition to that, have your grandchildren that you could be with on Sundays also. And uh, I'm not sure why he brought the ax and the wood. Uh, it might, reminds me that I didn't pay my tithes this month yet, so who knows? All right. This is Dr. Richard Lozer. He's a senior pastor of Bull Verde Baptist Church. Dick's been a pastor since 19... Oh, I'm excuse me, that's not 19, that's 2002. He's a graduate of Tennessee Temple University and Temple Baptist Theological Seminary. He received his doctorate of ministry from Luther Rice Seminary prior to becoming the pastor of BBC at BBC. That's Bull Birdie Baptist Church, for those of you who don't recognize the BBC. That's not British Broadcasting Company. <laughs> I guess he could have been pastor there, too. Uh, he served in Decatur, Illinois for 16 years, Spring, Texas for 13 years. Dick and his wife, Charlotte, have three grown sons, and they are the proud... And they are proud to be blessed of having 12 grandchildren. 14. 14. Okay, well, this is an old bio yes, then. My apologies. As a grandfather myself, I know that you always take advantage to lift up how many grandchildren you have. <laughs> and I'm behind. I only have four. Three daughters and a new grandson. So it's been a very special pleasure for me to be in Bulverde and be in this gentleman's church. One of these, I was talking to him before I came in here about maybe a job that I could have in the church to work is, is something that I could do, and uh, ground maintenance came up, so who knows. Anyway, Dr. Lozer, come and, and share the word. Oh, you're having a uh, uh, I brought this just in case he tried to sing again. So, I'm a, borrow this stand for a second. Uh, thanks for having me back. I enjoyed it last time, and uh, I always uh, enjoy being able to preach the Word and let people know what God is doing. You ever buy anything? You see it advertised on TV, you buy something, and then after you get it, you find out it's really pretty worthless. I mean, you feel like an idiot for staying up late watching the commercials where they're trying to sell you this stuff. But there are some pretty useless things in this world. I got some pictures of, of, of four different useless things. Go ahead and put the first one up there, um, if we can get it. There it is. Um, I, I, I guess if you have a problem with allergies, that might be useful. But these are actual inventions that, that people have, have come up with. Uh, uh, I don't know, I, I consider that pretty useless, but we'll put the next one up there, would you? Uh, this one, now I don't know, this might work. This is a thing, you put your hamburger patty in it, you stick it on the exhaust of your car, <laughs> and, and the heat from the exhaust of your car cooks the hamburger while you drive down the road, and the, well, I don't know, I mean, you know, it could work. I mean, actually, it's pretty, you put, the, go, let's see the next one. Uh, this is for you ladies who... <laughs> This is for you ladies who have trouble finding your mouth in the morning. Uh, it could help. I don't know. I, I don't, have any of you bought one of those? I hope not. Uh, we got one more. There you go. Just in case you don't want to get your feet wet when you're in the rain. But, so those, those are just, you, can, you can turn that off right now. Uh, we'll put a scripture up there in just a minute. But there are some useless things out there, right? 
And we laugh at those things. But what's not funny is when you feel useless. Uh, it's funny to laugh at those crazy inventions, and uh, you could get on the internet and look up useful, inv useless inventions, and you'll have thousands of them that will pop up out there. But what's not funny is when we, as a believer, feel useless. And there are a lot of people like that. There are a lot of people who, who, who are looking at themselves and thinking, what has God got for me to do? What am I doing, and, and why am I here on this earth? Uh, today, you can go to any bookstore, or you can look at different things on TV, and you'll find all these books on self-image, improving your self-image, and getting a good view of yourself. And uh, the, the, our culture has kind of picked up on that, because they don't want kids to feel bad in school, so a lot of the schools are getting rid of failing grades, you know, because they don't want anybody to feel, don't, that, that hasn't happened here. So um, failing grades are bad. You don't want to fail a grade. But, you know, they don't want kids to feel bad, so they get rid of failing grades. And uh, children who uh, participate in sports, it's not just the winning team. Everybody gets a trophy now because, hey, everybody is a winner. I mean, there's no losers in life, and, and that's okay uh, because we just don't want to harm people's self-image. And it's important that we have a positive self-image. But what's more important is our God image, who we are in Jesus Christ, who God has made us to be. And unfortunately, in my years of pastoring, in the last 44 years that I've pastored churches, I've found a lot of people who started out really excited about serving God, and they quit. They're, they're no longer doing that. They were active, and they were involved, but they've kind of faded away. They've, for whatever reason, they've burned out. Maybe they got their feelings hurt. They became bitter uh, about something that happened in the church, or they got discouraged, or just totally uncooperative, life weight. The Southern Baptist book store and publisher has done a survey. They said, and this kind of troubled me because I'm a pastor and, and I know y'all are here preparing for ministry and preparing for what God has for you to do. But here's the, some statistics. They said that 45% of all people involved in ministry feel burned out at one time or another. That's almost half. 75% of people in ministry are feeling discouraged. And there, this is the statistic that really just blew my mind. They said there are 1,500 people involved in ministry, not pastors, but just people involved in ministry. 1,500 are leaving the ministry every month because of discouragement. Because they just, maybe they, they feel useless. They feel like there's nothing for them to do. There's nothing that they can add. And I don't know, maybe they blame other people for it. They blame themselves or they blame stuff. But life gets busy, doesn't it? I mean, things get hectic. Life happens, and, and we get knocked off balance in, in what we're doing in our life, and there's a lot of stuff that goes on out there. And we get, I think we get overloaded with activity. There's just too many things going on. There's too much happening, and we just don't have time for the Lord, don't have time to feel like we're accomplishing anything. But yet, throughout the Gospels, we're told that God saved us to serve. So we shouldn't get burned out because that's what God called us to do. In Matthew 21, he says, go work for me today in the fields. And in John chapter 9, he said, work today while it's called today because night's coming when no man can work. We have a job to do. In John 15, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Every branch in me is to bear fruit. We're to be producing something for Christ in our day-to-day -day living. In Matthew 9, when he, he stepped out of the of the temple, and he looked out at the multitudes, and he was moved with compassion. And he said, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So there's plenty of work to do. That's the Gospels. Uh, that's not even including Paul. I mean, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He says, you have been gifted to work. God has created you unto good works. He has called you to serve him. He wrote to the church at Corinth in, in 2 Corinthians. He said, guys, you are ambassadors. You are representatives of Jesus Christ. Now get out there and do the job. So if all that's true, I mean, if we're really called to serve and God has a purpose for our life, why do we feel so useless sometimes? I know y'all are, some of you doing maybe midterm exams this week. Some of you are going to... You know, go lay on the beach all week next week and study while you're there for your midterms. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you, you'll be prepared for your midterms. I know it's frustrating. College and, and seminary and that kind of work is frustrating. But if it's true that God called us to do something for him, why do we feel so useless? All right. Let me show you a passage of scripture that may help us understand this. If you put that scripture passage up there on the screen for me, because some of you don't have your Bibles with you. I know you got them on your phone. This is 2 Kings chapter 6. 
And we're going to look at uh, a situation, uh, an event that happened in 2 Kings. And I'm going to have to put my Bible down to pick up the axe here in just a little bit. But uh, let, me, let me explain the circumstances. Look at the first four verses there. It says, Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and we'll make us a place to dwell. And he answered, and he said, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, and he said, I will go. So he went with them, and they went, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. All right, here's the circumstance. Here's what's going on. Elisha is now the prophet. Elijah had been the prophet, but he was taken up into heaven, and so Elisha picks up the mantle, and he becomes the prophet over Israel now. And he is, he, he's a little more flamboyant. He's a little more flashy than Elijah was. And he started a school of prophets. He started a... But it was probably Baptist, if they had Baptist back in the Old Testament, I don't know. But he started a school to train prophets, to teach them. So he started the school of prophets. Well, it, got, it became so popular, they outgrew their facility. So they said, we need to build a bigger building. We need to have a better facility. We need to have a bigger facility. He said, hey, here's a good idea. Let's all go down to the Jordan River. We'll cut down some trees. We'll bring them back, and we'll build ourselves a bigger facility. We'll go down there chopping down some trees. So one of the guys, one of the guys that's in school, one of these college students came to Elisha and says, hey, Elisha, why don't you go with us? You know, we'd be thrilled if you'd go with us. So Elisha says, okay, I'm going to go. So at the end of that verse 4, Elisha and the students that are in the school of prophets, they go down to the Jordan River to chop down trees. They got this common goal to build a bigger place so they can learn to serve God as a prophet of the Lord. Now you're here in this school and you came with a common goal, to prepare for the future, to prepare your life, to, to find a place where God wants to use you. But then there's a problem that comes up. Look at verse number five. In verse number five, but as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water and he cried out, and alas, my master, it was borrowed. So here's the deal. They're working away, and they're chopping down the trees, and they're, they're down there. They're all working. I don't know how many of them went, and I don't know how long they'd been chopping trees before things uh, fell apart. So here's this guy. He's got this axe, and uh, maybe I can get it out of here. He's got this axe, and he's chopping. You've heard of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? This is not it. Okay, just so you know. So this guy's got his axe, and he's chopping wood, and something happens. As he's chopping wood, the axe head falls off. And it falls into the Jordan River. And he's sitting there. He'd been chopping down trees. He'd been doing a good job. And they're all working together. The prophet Elijah is there. And he, he swings his axe back. And all of a sudden, the head flies off. And he says, whoops. And he says, he cries out. If you look at verse 5, it says, but as he was felling his log, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out. And he said, alas, master, it was borrowed. So here's this college kid this college student, in the school of prophets, he went down there with good intentions. With everybody else, they were all working together. They all had a, uh, the same goal, to cut down trees so they could, they, they could build a bigger place, and he lost the axe head off of the axe that he had borrowed. Now, why did he borrow it? Well, I know I borrowed it. He was a poor college kid. He didn't have any money. So he borrowed an axe from somebody. And he lost the head off of the axe. So now he's not able to do any more work. It wasn't his axe to start with, didn't belong to him, it was somebody else's, but he was using it to the best of his ability. Now, here's what I want you to see. There, there's only, whenever you study the Bible, there's only one interpretation to a passage, but there can be a whole lot of applications of that interpretation, okay? So here's the application today. I want you to look at this axe handle as though this represents you. This is you. This is you without any head. The axe head represents the power or the ability to accomplish something. In this case, the axe is you, the head is the power of God. So what's the axe? Come on, wake up, talk to me here. Who, what's the axe handle? You, okay, it is you, it, it's us, it's me, okay? What's the axe head represent? The power of God. So here's, the, here's this guy, he was chopping away the handle represents everything that we are apart from the power of God. The, the head represents God. Here's this guy. He's chopping away. He's busy at the work of the Lord, and he's doing something right, but it doesn't work because he's lost the power. So how did he lose it? There are a lot of times that we get busy in the work of the Lord without the Lord of the work involved in it. 
Too many times that we're doing stuff in the strength of our own effort, but we really don't have the power of God, and that's why we feel useless. Because God didn't create us to serve of our own energy. He created us to serve in his energy. So why did this guy, I mean, how, do, how does this happen? Sometimes it's just because of pretense, because we're just faking it. We're just pretending. I mean, there are some people that are acting like they're serving the Lord that really never had the power of God in their life to start with. I mean, they're not even believers. They're just faking it. And sometimes it's because of pride. I mean, we act like what we're really not. We, we think we're more than what God knows us to be. We think we're better than somebody else because we're going to the Baptist University of America. We, we think we're better believers because uh, we play guitar and sing or because uh, we read the Bible more. We have scripture memorized. And, you know, we, we, it's not that we don't have problems. It's just that our problems are a lot more respectable than everybody else's problems. You know, our problems aren't near as bad as theirs. Or maybe it's just the pride that we're concerned about what other people are going to think. I mean, after all, I'm in a Baptist university. i got to act like a Christian. But you're acting like the Christian just with the handle with no power. You've lost the power of God. It, it, and the thing about it is this guy says, hey, you know what? I lost it, and it was borrowed. The power of God is not yours. It's God. He just loans it to you. He gives you that power. You borrow it from him. You don't deserve it, but you, you get it because God gives it. And, and maybe he lost it simply because maybe we lose that power just out of personal disobedience. I mean, look, look at Adam. Look at David. Look at, look at Achan when he, when he stole the thing. So here's this guy. He's been chopping away. Axe head flies off. He looks over his shoulder, lands in the water, and sinks to the bottom. And he cries out, and he said, it's borrowed. So what are his options? What does he do now? What do you do when you feel useless? What do you do? What are your options? Well, he could quit working. I mean, he could just stop. <laughs> I got an axe head. I can't work. I'm just going to watch everybody else, you know. And he leans on the axe head and watches everybody else out there sweating and straining and chopping down trees and doing the work that they'd set out to do together. Uh, th that's one option. Second option, he could fake it, right? I mean, he could sit out there and just swing this axe handle away and bang at the side of a tree. And I mean, he'd never cut a tree down, but he'd sure look busy. And there's a whole lot of believers out there that are just faking it. I mean, they're going through all the motions. They're saying the right words. They're doing the right thing. They're going the right places. They're dressing the right way. They're carrying around their Bible. And, look right, and they're just faking it because they don't have any power of God on their life. They're just going through the motions. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of what I call performance-based acceptance. The more I perform, the, more, the better I look, the more people are going to think I'm really a believer. So he could have done that. Or... He could have set about to try and get back what he lost. I mean, that's an option, right? To get back the axe head? So we can fake it. We can quit. We can say, oh, what's the point? I'm not accomplishing anything for you. I just quit. Or we can just fake it and just keep going. Or we can try and get back what we lost. So look at verse 5, 6, and 7. Here's the solution. He said, but as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. He cried out, and he said, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick. That's the, the master. Cut off a stick, and he threw it in there, and he made the iron float, and he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand, and he took it. So here's the steps to getting back the power of God if you've lost it. Here's what he did. Now, this isn't me. I didn't make this up. Just taking this straight from the book of 2 Kings. And the first thing he did is he cried out. He, he, he realized he had lost the power and he cried out. This is just being broken, just brokenness. He says, alas. It's a, a word in the Hebrew language that, that just means to be bitterly, completely, totally broken. Alas, oh, oh man, I've lost it. So he cries out in brokenness. He knows he's useless. He knows he can't accomplish anything else. And he's, he's crushed in the fact that he lost the power to do and to be helpful. It's like David. In Psalm 51, when David confessed his sin, God said, David said, God, I know you didn't want sacrifice or I would have given it. I know you didn't want offerings or I would have given that. But what did God want? A broken heart and a contrite spirit. When you feel useless that you don't have the power of God working in your life at all, then you need to cry out to God and say, Lord, I lost it in brokenness. And until you get to that place, the scripture says that godly sorrow produces repentance. Second thing, 
Who did he call out to? He cried out, and he said, Alas, my master. Now, in his case, the master was who? Elisha. But who was Elisha? Elisha was the representative of God. Elisha was the prophet of God. So, basically, he is crying out to God, even though it's not really God, but it's God's representative. He's crying out to the man of God. We complain to everybody else about the fact that we're not doing any good instead of calling out to God. So step one, cry out in brokenness. Step two, cry out in brokenness to God. Step three, confession. And this is where it starts to get tough. The man of God said, where did it fall? He said, I lost it. But the guy, the, the, the prophet of God asked him a tough question. He said, where did you lose it? Now, the guy knew where he lost it. So my question to you is, if you're feeling useless in the service of the Lord, why? Who moved? God hasn't. And this is the hard question to answer. Because it gets down to the nitty of greedy. What happened in your life to make you lose the power of God? Was it anger? Was it bitterness? Hurt? Pride, disobedience, immorality, too much time looking at the wrong stuff on TV and the computer or reading the wrong things, getting involved in the worldliness of the, 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 the world that will draw you away from God. What is it that made you, where did you lose it? And I'll guarantee you that if you feel useless and you don't feel like the power of God's on your life, you know exactly where you lost it. You know and this is, this is the tough part because the prophet says, okay, you lost it. Okay, where did it go? And so he points. And this is what it takes. This is confession is agreeing with God and saying, I know why I lost it. I know where it was and being willing to admit that. And then the next step is the correction. This is God's response. You know what God did? He did the impossible. He took a piece of iron that had sunk down into the bottom of the Jordan River and he made it swim. I don't know whether he put arms on it, whether it was doing the backstroke or butterfly, but he made that piece of iron float to the top and swim. God did the impossible. You may think that you have lost the power of God completely and there's nothing more for you to do. God can change that. God does the impossible in lives all the time. He does the impossible in restoring marriages, restoring relationships, and forgiving sin, and putting back the power that you need in your life. And he will do the impossible. But I want you to look at something else. He made the iron swim, but verse 7, the prophet says, take it up. So he reached out his hand and he took it up. Here's the final command in this process. He says, take it up. Here's what God does. God says, all right, you've confessed your sin, you've repented of it, you've come to me in brokenness, you've cried out, you've told me where you lost it, you know what's going on. And he says, I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to make the power of God available to you. God makes it available. He puts it within our reach, but he doesn't put it in our hand. You think about that. He didn't make that iron jump up out of the river and put itself back on the axe handle, put it back in the hand of the guy. And God doesn't do that. What he does, he says, okay, let me see how serious you are about really wanting the power of God back. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to put it within your reach, but it's up to you to reach out and take the power of God and apply it to your life. So we don't know how the story ended. We assume that he reached out and that he took it up. You know what I've discovered over the years? As long as you're trying to fix the problem on your own, God's willing to let you do that until you come to the place of brokenness. But then he says, okay, you want it back? I'm going to put it here. So he sets it right out there, and you're right here. He doesn't put it right in my lap, but he makes his power available through his forgiveness. So when you get to the place of uselessness, that's a good place to be because then you're at the place of brokenness where there's nothing else going to work other than just turning to God and crying out to him and saying, I lost it, God. I lost it. Or you can keep, you can keep taking your life and just keep swinging away, acting like you're doing good, and nothing ever be accomplished with it. You say, well, so where do I go from here? Well, number one, look at where you are in your life. 
and realize that any power that you have to accomplish anything is just borrowed anyway. It's from God. It's not yours. So look at where you are. Realize that the power is not in you. It's in the Lord. Confess. If there's something in your life that has caused you to feel useless, confess that. Turn from it. Turn back to the Lord and cry out to the Lord. You know, it's a sad thing to neglect the power of God. It's even sadder not to know that it's gone. At least this guy realized he lost the axe head. He knew it was gone. And I'll guarantee you, if you're feeling useless, you probably know why. Would you just cry out to God? Mid-semester, you're coming toward the end of a, of a school year, uh, midterms, the last semester for some of you. Uh, how many of you, this is your senior year, you're going to be graduating, all right? So you're trying to seek God's will, want to know where God wants you to go, what he wants you to do. Don't go through life without knowing that you have the power of God. If you feel useless, it's because the axe head has flown off and landed somewhere else. Doesn't mean you ignore it. Don't fake it. You can get it back if you're willing to crawl out to God with brokenness. Come to him in confession. Reach out and take it when he performs that miracle and puts it back within your reach. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I ask this morning that uh, he would just speak to our hearts. God, I don't... Uh, know the young people, the adults here today. I don't know the ones that, I don't know what they're going through in their life, but you do. You know their financial situation. You know their moral situation. You know their academic situation. You know all of that. But I know for a fact that in our society and culture, our lives get so busy that sometimes we feel like we're spinning our wheels and not accomplishing anything. And we look at things and we think maybe we're, wasting our time, and we feel pretty useless. I want to pray that you would encourage those that are here today as we have looked at the Word of God and examined your, your truth, that we would learn from the story of the Old Testament and apply these principles to our life when we feel like we've lost the power of God. Teach us. Encourage these young people. Give them a, a great time of relaxation during their spring break those that are studying and doing the, the midterms, Lord, I pray that you give them a complete recall of the things that they have studied and those that are preparing for those that you'd help them to study the right things and to retain the right information. Keep your hand of blessing upon them as they look ahead to prepare to serve you. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord bless you.